and welcome back to an episode of the Clear Jets Podcast for Ben Blessington and Michael Nania. Michael, OTA is well underway at Florham Park. The Jets entering the last week of their voluntary portion uh, of the offseason. And then the next week they have the three-day mandatory mini camp, and then it's six weeks off, and then it's training camp, and the, the 2022 season's officially underway. So we're, we're chugging along, Michael. How are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good, but to be honest with you, I kind of need this offseason to go a little bit faster because we are on that weird point of the calendar year where this is the most dead portion of the year. I think on the football calendar, there's not a ton, even with OTAs, you don't get a ton of news out of it and it's not the easiest to evaluate or take much out of. So, you know, there's a lot of overreacting over analysis. So um, it's fun to kind of sit here and have this chill part of the year, sort of sit back, analyze things, project the year, but it's also kind of boring to be frank. So um, I'm looking forward to this off season to kind of get chugging along and start getting to the more, um, to the more newsworthy portions of the off season. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we've taken a few weeks off. We, we do have uh, quite a few things planned for the next few weeks that are a little different for this podcast to, to kind of make up for the, uh, the boring parts of the off season. So we're excited about that. But for today, Michael, Honestly, we just have kind of a list of just random Jets topics and just kind of run through the gauntlet. I mean, we will start with some of the more relevant stuff. Like you mentioned, there are some storylines that come out of OTAs and some are more important than the others. Uh, we'll, we'll get through those and then I guess talk about a few topics and we'll get out of here. Uh, I think the one that kind of blew up this past week was there was the report about Zach Wilson uh, struggling with accuracy in OTAs, which if anybody read into it knows it was a you know bit of a bullshit report. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll hand it over to you before I give my thoughts. Just what were your thoughts when you read that? I know you, you, you went at it a little bit on Twitter. Um, and just your thoughts on those type of reports in general about what we can kind of glean from OTA practices. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, this one specifically is definitely kind of taken out of context because I think the reporting question was, it was from a national reporter from, I think, Pro Football Network who went to one OTA practice and he was talking about four, a stretch of four bad passes that he threw. And then he noticed that Wilson or noted that Wilson threw well over the rest of the practice. So, I mean, to, it, it doesn't seem like a conclusive amount of evidence to sort of write that headline about. But at the same time, I mean, this is that part, part of the offseason where, you know, fan bases are, you know, taking shots at each other. You know, we were clowning the Dolphins for that one clip about to, uh, where he had that under through underthrown ball. So, I mean, you know, it, it's that point, point of the off season where you got to find quotes wherever you can get them, but that was still a massive overreaction. And I know Robbie, Robbie Sabo from jet X factor was at, uh, well, I don't think that practice, um, the first, but, one? uh, the first OTA practice that was open to the media. And, you know, he said it was not a perfect day for Wilson, but you know, he had some good moments and some bad moments. It, it's OTAs and another, I think a huge thing to remember with these practices is that um, when you're an established player, like, you know, the second year franchise quarterback, he's not necessarily going out there to produce and, you know, win games. Like he could be trying different footwork or, you know, trying to go through more reads than he usually would or get the ball out quicker or, you know, take a shotgun snap with his right foot forward instead of his left or vice versa. You know, it's, it's a trial period. You're not, going out there to perform and make highlights you're going out there to get better so i mean it's i I just think all right i guess you have a counterpoint there so i'll let you go with that but um yeah it's just i don't think it's something to react to too much unless someone is absolutely egregious or absolutely amazing yeah i I agreed with pretty much everything you said there about look it's otas that report based off of four passes yeah, at a practice where he actually ended up finishing relatively all right, and then the first practice that was open to the the media, like you talked about, the Robbie was at. The general consensus was that he looked a little sharper, that he was progressing through his reads faster, and there, you know, it's there are some storylines that I think you can take credence to that that come out of of OTAs, like the fact that he's that he's bulked up. I think that's a, a good sign. He talked about wanting to do that coming out, um, or you know, leaving week eighteen at Buffalo. He said he wants to add some weight. Uh, he clearly was able to do that. He looks bigger. Uh, He looks more like an NFL quarterback. Um, And I think that's going to help him, you know, survive a little bit uh, through, through, through a 17 game season. Um, So there's things like that. And then, yeah, like a a stretch of four passes where he, where he wasn't as accurate. I mean, that is really a non-starter to me. I remember seeing reports about Joe Burrow's practice performance in training camp 
this past year about how he was struggling in training camp, and then they went over all the way to the Super Bowl. So these practices don't uh, – I mean, that was training camp, by the way. This is OTAs. Um, so the, the little bullshit reports you see on Twitter are, are nothing to live by. I disagree with you a little bit about, you know, like, yes, practice is a, is a time to be trying things out, I guess. And, you know, uh, you know he's not necessarily – on the field playoff game, whatever, going to take his check down immediately. Maybe he will try some windows or whatever, but at the same time, you know, he, he is trying to do the best job he can at quarterback in the jets. And so it's not like he's really doing that much different. I'm sure that he still, look, we saw in his rookie season, there are times where he struggled with accuracy. There are also some times where he had, you know, through some absolute dimes. So we know he can do both. Um, I think the accuracy will get better as the footwork gets better. I think he will kind of always, you know, even Tom Brady has passes that got away from him. And I think with Zach Wilson's play style and how his foot feet work and get kind of footwork and get away from him. I think sometimes you, you will see some, some Aaron passes from Zach Wilson. That's not really as important to me. What's important, I guess, the only thing you can kind of glean from these practices, if you're going to try to take anything away outside of what he's um, what he's added is just how he's progressing through his reads, you know, how quickly is he? And just, even if it's a seven on seven period or, or an 11, 11 period, you know, two and touch, you know, how quickly is he diagnosing? Okay. That's that's cover two. This is where I need to go in this play. Can I get to read one, read two ball out, you know, and, and is that ball coming out when his back foot's hitting on his, on a three-step drop, you know, like though you can kind of get a sense for his timing of the plays, but the accuracy, it's like, I already know that Zach Wilson can be an, you know, can be an NFL quarterback. Sure. I'm sure he struggled with accuracy at times, but he's also had some, some great throws. I'm not really worried about him missing a few throws in a practice in, in May. Um, or I guess it's June now. Um, so yeah, I, I thought that that report was, was complete bogus, but yeah, I, I think when you get to training camp, I think it is okay to criticize players who have, you know, bad stretches in training camp, or at least, you know, take something away from that. I don't think you have to completely minimize it. It's not the end all be all. Like I just mentioned with Joe Burrow, but look, like if Zach Wilson is struggling over multiple days in training camp, it probably isn't a great time for the season. It doesn't necessarily mean anything, but you know, you shouldn't downplay things too much. I think we saw that we learned that a little bit last year when, you know, the beat reporters were really getting on Denzel Mims and we were like, no, you know, I think us on this podcast, even were like, no, we know what we saw as a rookie and then he barely played. And I think that was an indication of how the coaching staff felt about him. The same thing goes for Makai Becton who was really struggling and granted, we didn't really get to see too much of him. I thought he looked okay in, in week one and then he got hurt. Um, but those reports kind of did manifest themselves throughout the season, I guess you could say. So you shouldn't downplay things too much, but when you're talking about four passes in OTA practice, there's really not much to learn um, just outside of how he looks and the type of shape that these guys are in. Um, you know, the flip side of that, um, I guess really not the flip side of that, but like another guy who came in who looks, looks great. Uh, apparently Denzel Mims seems like, uh, seems like he's in a lot better shape. He's not battling, uh, you know, food poisoning this time around. Um, so we'll see, maybe he's a guy who can turn his career around a little bit and see if the Jets can carve a rule out for him. I think those are the type of stories that you can take away from OTAs is just the type of shape a guy looks um, looks in and, and then we'll see how things progress over, over the off season. Um, I think the other thing that was interesting and you wrote an article about this and in a rare moment of, of negative uh, Jets uh, press is Jeff Ulbrich had talked about how they have a strict rule of they're only going to play their defensive linemen 30 to 35 snaps per game. They, they have a deep defensive line rotation. They want to keep those guys fresh throughout the entire game so they can, you know, do that, you know, uh, live up to that whole all gas, no break mentality, every single play. Um, thinks it'll keep them fresher throughout the game and throughout the season. You were very against that. You pointed out how that would be a pretty big anomaly. Uh, and even for Robert Sala, who, you know, Nick Bosa and Eric Armstead and DeForest Buckner, they weren't, they, they were playing 46, 50 snaps a game. Um, I can you just kind of lay out your thought process as to why you might raise a bit of a red flag um, as to what Jeff Ulbrich was saying? Yeah. I, I mean, look, I get the philosophy. I, I absolutely do. It's obviously, um, this is a defense that, you know, plays aggressively. They want these guys to penetrate rather than thinking, um, get up the field, get into the backfield, shoot through gaps, without having to, you know, read plays or anything like that. And, you know, it can be physically taxing and rest is a good thing. And this is also a depth chart that is very deep with pass rushers, good athletes, and you want to get all these guys playing time. But um, but just specifically the number that Ulbrich threw out there is it's just it's really outlandish. He said 30 he said he doesn't want anyone playing more than 35 snaps as an absolute maximum. And I don't, I don't know if he just messed up the math or something. 
or like, you know, didn't know the exact numbers that he was saying. Um, but if that is really what they do, then that's way too over the line because you, when you break down the numbers and consider how much that is, you know, 30, 35 snaps per game is like, depending on how many plays per game your defense plays is like 45 to 55% of the snaps. So you're telling me that Quinn and Williams, John Franklin Myers and Carl Lawson are going to play half of the game maximum every single week. I think that's, that's definitely ridiculous. And it, no other team in the league does that. Every single team in the league last year had at least one defensive lineman who averaged at least 35 snaps a game. And the average team had four of those guys. So it's, it's definitely an extreme rule. I think, Um, you know, rest is good, obviously, but you know, only to an extent you can't like, is Quinn and Williams getting that much better from playing a few snaps fewer per game to where you'd want to take away a significant chunk of his playing time and give it to a backup like Nathan Shepard or Jonathan Marshall, who's much less talented. I don't think so personally. And, you know, to support that Quinn and Williams had a better 2020 season than 2021. And he was playing more snaps per game in 2020 than he was in 2021. And I think Quinn should be playing more snaps because some of the players he gets compared to who put up bigger numbers, like, you know, Jeffrey Simmons, for example, with the Titans, um, he produces similarly to those guys on a per play basis, but he puts up worse value numbers because he's not playing that much relative to them. Even last year, I think he was around 40 snaps per game and a little bit over 60% of the snaps. And that's already on the low end for a guy of his caliber. So then to dial that back even more, especially when your interior D line is lacking and, you know, run defense talent, you lost fully Fadakasi. You didn't really add anybody else uh, to replace that. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I think, Rest is a good thing, but you can't, you know, overvalue rest versus talent. You can't because last year, you know, there were and now they have more talent than they did. There were a lot of injuries, but there were moments last season when you throw out they throw out a defensive line of Nathan Shepard, Sheldon Rankins, Ronald Blair and Tim Ward. Like they fully rotate the lineup and put all backups out there. Um, I, I, I think that. Just if they do go with the exact 35 snap limit, it's just too extreme in pursuit of rest. I think your best players have to be out there, specifically those three guys, um, Quinnen, JFM, and Lawson. They need to be playing 65, 70% of the snaps plus. So, you know, 45, around 45 snaps per game, I would say. Um, and, and Lawson, you could start him out slower if you want to ease him back in. Yeah. Um, but even in his 2019 season, where he's coming off a torn ACL the previous year, he still averaged 38 snaps per game. By the end of the year, he's playing 44 snaps per game. Um, and he played really well that year. So um, just 35 is really low. I, again, I don't know if he misspoke and just said the wrong numbers, but uh, 35 snaps is you're not playing your best players half the game. That just doesn't make sense. So uh, I, I get the philosophy, but those exact numbers are pretty extreme. Yeah, it's tough because I'm sure some people are listening to this and saying like, you know, well, they're, they coach football and we don't. And that's completely right. fair. But at the yeah, same time, this Jets defense is one of the worst team, team defenses in, in history uh, of this team. That was a terrible way of saying it. This defense was horrific last year. And so I don't think Jeff Ulbrich has earned himself that much wiggle room. Um, and, and if this strategy isn't really working out through the first four or five, six games, I think they definitely need to switch it up. I, I really hope, and we talked about this, and this is – you know, getting way ahead of ourselves and nightmare snares, or whatever. But if, if the defense really doesn't improve, I really hope Robert Sala doesn't tie himself down to Jeff Ulbrich. And I'm, I'm kind of worried he could because, you know, some people wanted Sala to be fired uh, after 2017 or 2018, one of those years. Yes, 2018. Um, but Kyle Shannon stuck by him and then ended up in 2019. They really took off and then went to the Super Bowl, whatever. So I, I'm worried. And Sala does seem like a loyal guy who wants to give his coaches time to grow. But you know, Jeff Obrick in this unit was really bad last year. And yeah, they weren't the most talented unit in the world. Sure. But I think you definitely had pieces on the defensive side of the football. I thought you were getting relatively good numbers out of your corners, relatively good play out of your corners. Obviously the safeties were bad. 
Um, the linebackers outside of CJ Mosley were bad. And like you mentioned, the depth in the defensive line was not where it needed to be, but you still had Quinn and you still had CJ Mosley. You still had JFM. I mean, you still had players and in another system, you might've seen better production and maybe a, you know, a top 25 unit or a top 20 unit instead of 32nd ranked defense uh, in the league. I think we kind of noted that this is a defense that if you have great players, you know, it's going to really allow the players to shine. But if not, these players are going to get bullied. And this idea of, you know, how many games did we see last year, especially where it's like, you know, this idea we're going to have a defensive lineman go, you know, all gas. They're not going to read blocks. They're not going to read gaps or anything. Uh, and then teams just ran draws and screens and just threw it right over their heads. I mean, the Jets got out schemed on defense how many times last year? Um, so that's a bit of a, a concerning thing to me. I can understand Lawson. I don't mind him being on a bit of a snap count. Look, he's coming off an Achilles. He's a guy who has been injured a little bit throughout his career. And edge rushers in particular, it's like, yeah, I think that that burst – you know, that, that uh, you don't want them to fatigue as much throughout the game. It's like, I'm fine if Lawson, you know, you definitely have them out there in third downs, but you don't have to have them on every first and second down out there. Um, but the guys in the interior, especially a guy like Quinnen, I mean, it's a war of attrition in there and uh, interior defensive linemen are going to lose most of the reps that they have. They just have, you know, one, two, three, four wins a game and those make the difference. And so when you take away most of his plays, it's like, I don't think the evidence is really there that you're going to see, that much of a drop off, like you said, when he plays right. as opposed to 35 snaps playing 48 snaps, I don't think you're going to see the same production in 35 that you might see in 48. I think you're just taking away tickets for him to or chances for him to make a play. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I'm a little concerned about that. And like, yeah, they have good depth for sure. Like, you know, like Solomon Thomas and Sheldon Rankins, that's good depth, but it's like Sheldon Rankins was still pretty bad last year. Solomon Thomas right. is not, has not been good in his, in his NFL career. Um, the interior of this defense is it's like, it's good depth. But that doesn't make mean they're good starters. The you know, depth means like, Oh, if Quinn and Williams just go down, it's not a catastrophe. Uh, that's kind of how I feel. I, I feel like the edge rushers, I'm more okay with them rotating them out because I think that is a deeper, I think the jets have a really great depth there, especially when you consider uh, Bryce Huff and Jacob Martin uh, and the fact that you can kick out JFM, you have uh, Vinnie Curry. I, I kind of like the, the depth at edge more than I do the interior, the defensive line, especially considering they don't really have another run stopper outside of Quinn. And if you look at this, uh, the three techs that they have on the roster. So I don't know, uh, like you said, it's possible he misspoke. I doubt it. I think that that really is going to be their plan to really just try to rotate these guys and keep them fresh, but I'm sorry, you're going to see the drop off when you go from Quinn and Williams to Solomon Thomas. And when you go from uh, JFM to Sheldon Rankins, I mean, that's just, uh, or Nathan Shepard, or I guess Nathan Shepard is, is the, the backup run stuffing defense attack. I mean, who really is, let's say Quinn gets injured and it's first down or whatever. And it's clear that the team you're facing is going to, you know, the, the Ravens week one, you know, they're going to run the ball. What does your defensive line look like? You know, let's say Quinn is injured. Let's say Quinn gets injured in training camp. Who, who, what four defensive linemen are you putting down there, Michael, to defend the run? Yeah, that that's where it's going to get really tough. And that's, you know, the biggest question on this defensive line. Um, I mean, Man, it, it's tough. I, do you hopefully project Marshall to take over that role? Because I think the other guys you have, have you know, are more established NFL players, and you kind of know that they're not really suited for that role. Um, you know, JFM, great player, but I'm not putting him at one tech no. on on first and goal. Um, Although I think, the, I think I do think JFM is going to have a big year at three tech. I yeah, really yeah, I think he's sure. going to have a, a really awesome year there. Yeah, but, definitely. Um, but, you know, looking at who's going to play, you know, that two eye one tech role and the a gaps like Quinnen can do it. Great. Obviously. But like you said, when he's not out there, uh, I guess you could put Nathan Shepard in there, but he's really struggled <laughs> against the run in his career. It's not ideal. Uh, Rankins is not a good run stuffer either. Uh, I maybe Marshall is your best hope to step up and take that role. And his skill set is kind of like those guys too, more of an explosive athlete. Um, but he did play a lot of nose tackle in college. Uh, wasn't necessarily his strength, though, stopping the run. He's more so, again, an explosive, ath explosive athlete. So uh, it's it's a question mark. Yeah. Maybe they do have a move up their sleeves. I know Ogan Joby's out there, but he's another guy who kind of fits that mold of athleticism, pass rushing, more so than run defense. So it's it's a question mark. And, and to finish up the point on Ulbrich and the snap count and stuff, um, I, I think for everyone outside the big three, like, you know, go bananas. Like, I think then it makes sense to – you know, keep all those guys fresh so they could just, you know, whether it's Jacob Martin, Bryce Huff, um, even Jermaine, um, 
you know, rotate those guys a lot. Like all those guys get their, get to dip their toes and play 20% of the snaps. Then they could all come out and just go a hundred miles an hour every single time. I think that makes sense. And then, you know, mix and match based on skill set, run pass, you know, maybe the tackle you're playing that week, one guy's better matchup than the other things like that. But uh, if you're going to impose that limit on your big three, I think you're just sacrificing too much talent in the name of rest, which is a good thing, but also not necessarily proven to have that much of an impact. And, and all defensive linemen rest anyway. The sport is already built that way. Even the top D linemen still only play 70, 80 percent. They get their rest. Everyone's getting it. And I think uh, that's going a little bit too far. But um, but back to the defensive line uh, and, and the, the run stuffing at defensive tackle. Uh, it, it's a big weakness. Yeah, I again, I totally agree on the edges. Uh, I think kind of circling back about like, you know, who are the four down linemen you're playing in, in, a, in a run defense, especially if, if a guy like Quinton's hurt. I think in all likelihood, I think they probably are just playing a Solomon Thomas or a Sheldon Rankins. I, th- I think they probably aren't, you know, unless they sign somebody. I mean, like you said, I, they could throw a, a Jonathan Marshall in there, but it's like it probably will just be a, a Nathan Shepard or a, a Solomon Thomas or a Sheldon Rankins, somebody who hasn't really proven that they can do that or at least at a high level. Um, so, yeah, the, the idea that you're – even if Quinn is healthy, that those guys are still going to be playing in, in run situations. I, I guess here's what I would take away from that. Is is Quinn not really getting much of a, a run on third down then? Because that's – you know, is, right. is Quinn going to get kind of relegated to the fully fought Akasi rule? And then in that case, are you paying him? I mean, there's just a lot of questions that come up with, okay, we're only going to play all of our guys 30 to 35, and that's a hard limit. Like, I get it with the edge guys, but, like, with a guy like Quinn, and especially a guy who's entering a contract year, it's like, I'm sorry, well, if he's only playing 30, 35 snaps, I don't think he's getting – we'll see how the type of season he has, but, like, is he going to get top-tier money? <laughs> because he's right. the only guy that can play on first down then in that role, or at least proven he can do it at a high level. Um, so, yeah, they really need – in terms of under-the-radar things that could really make or break this team – another guy stepping up in that position, a Jonathan Marshall or a Tanzel smart or hell, maybe a Nathan Shepard at that. That's age. a great name. Tanzel smart is a good under the radar one to throw in there. Yeah. He performed well in the preseason or hell yep. maybe Nathan Shepard at age 42 can finally <laughs> make the leap. Um, but somebody has to prove that they can do it outside of Quinnen because one, they're going to be rotating him and two, it's a violent game. Shit happens. And Quinnen has gotten injured before. So it's like, yeah, that it's like we're deep at defensive line, but they don't have the, the run stopper. And that, that is concerning. And especially with how bad this run defense was last year, the Ravens are a a great test for them. Week one. Um, It'll be really fascinating to see how they play them because the Ravens are a run first team. And I, you do get kind of worried about that, but it's like, you know, you look at how this defensive line matches up against their offensive line. I kind of feel like the jets might have the advantage. And especially you look at the the receivers versus um, the jets corners. It's like the jets definitely have the advantage there. So it's really going to come down to Lamar running the football um, and you know, I'm sure the Ravens will scheme some stuff up to try to get past this, the style of this attack style of defense, the jets play, but you know, it, it doesn't help the, the weaknesses that the jets have in their defensive line, defending the run past Quinn and Williams it doesn't help that their linebacker core isn't some proven, uh, unit outside of CJ Mosley. I mean, I think there are some there are some guys in this defense that are definitely going to help out the run game. I mean, I think obviously Quinn is the number one CJ is number two, Jordan Whitehead's another guy, but it's like, you know, Quincy Williams missed quite a few gaps last year. I mean, it, it, the Ravens are a, a very interesting team. Obviously they're a super unique team and they're not going to face anybody else like them um, for the rest of the year, but it's going to test this jets run defense right off the bat. I think this jets team is, is built to win on third down. I think they're, they're built to win in, in passing situations, but I'm worried about their run defense. I'm worried about their ability to defend screens and, and draws and misdirections and stuff that just exploits their, their attack style of defense. Um, and we'll just, we'll learn a lot about Jeff Ulbrich as a coach. I mean, how much is he willing to adjust? Cause I think that would be the one thing that you're a little concerned about is offensively. It does seem like Michael floor, at least last year down the stretch, you know, they wanted to play that, that 12 personnel style of offense. They really tried to fit a square peg into a round hole for five, six weeks. St- wasn't working. The Jets didn't have the tight ends to do it. And the Jets ended up running the most 10 personnel out of the entire NFL, which you wouldn't have expected. Uh, and it worked. And it's like, I don't necessarily think you saw the same adjustments on the defensive side of the football. Does, does the, the lack of adjustments from the Jets defense last year scare you as you, as you look forward to this, this new year where it's like, there's a very clear weakness uh, in terms of 
their ability to stop the run past Quinn and Williams. And then when you look at the linebackers, uh, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's, that's probably what my biggest question for the coaching staff is, um, you know, specifically Ulbrich and, you know, defensively the lack of adjustments and can this team adapt to its talent, you know, both um, from an overarching perspective and then game to game, because I think last year it, we never really saw them catch up with those ru- opposing run plays that were designed to exploit their defensive line. Um, any type of gap run, all that stuff you mentioned, draws, misdirection, you know, stuff that's designed to exploit this defense. And, and look, it's a natural weakness that you have to deal with, but you know, there are ways to, to counter that, you know, switch up the fronts that you're playing every now and then. Um, you don't have to be so strict to your one style play and allow the other team to keep beating you up the same way. Um, because like Greg Williams did that, like he yeah. wasn't really strictly three, four or four, three, he mixed it up a lot. And that's not to say he was perfect. And that defense was amazing, but um, you know, like there are other weaknesses he had. And he, but... and he, by the way, he was playing with the worst defense and right. They played better. Yeah, exactly. So um, it would have been nice to, to see that. And now we get to this off season and we kind of hear this thing about, you know, we're still playing all out. We don't, think we don't he even said in that same press conference about the the snap limit um he's saying like we don't read gaps um we just attack and stuff like that it's like i i get it but like this just seems pretty extreme it it seems like the defense kind of has quite a few extreme philosophies going on right now and it's as great as it is to have an identity you don't want to go too far to where you're so uh, attached to what you're trying to do to where other teams are just exploiting you over and over. And that's what was kind of happening last season. And it doesn't seem as if they really overcome that. And the talent is a lot better. So they should be able to health provided um, be able to execute the scheme better. You know, they have the ability to use this aggressive, aggressive scheme to have a top five to 10 pass rush. They have the corners to capitalize on that pass rush. Um, So the talent is better and they should be good uh, or better than they were last season. But um, uh, some more adaptability and just creativity would be good because it just seems like that they're playing one way and that's all they're doing. And again, great to have an identity, great to know who you are and get talent that fits that. And they've done that. So they're in a good spot to really execute their vision, but it, you got to switch things up now and then throw teams for a loop, you know, be able to counter their counters um, and just not be a, you know, stagnant uh, team that's throwing the same thing out there every single week. So opponents can easily figure out, yeah. figure you, figure you out. So um, just a little bit more uh, sort of adaptability, malleability yeah. uh, would be good to see this season. Well, and I think that's what's made Bill Belichick and the Patriots so great is obviously they have their system, but it seems like their main goal on offense or defense wasn't necessarily to, you know, do what we do, but it was to take away what you try to do. I mean, obviously they're going to do what they do best at, at times, but it's like, yeah, they're going to adjust what they're doing um, to match what you're trying to do and try to take it away from you. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see. I mean, look again, going back to the main point at the beginning of this, this episode, it's like, it's June. <laughs> so, and it's right. one quote from Jeff Wolbrick. So we'll yeah. see how training camp of all sure. look, they might be right. I mean, it's just like, but I think it's a valid concern to bring up, especially when you saw the performance of last year, but it's like, look, if they are getting better performance uh, from their edge, which I think they will with the return of Carl Lawson and you get to move JFM inside and they got Jermaine Johnson. I mean, if they, if they, every single game for this team will come down to the trenches. If the jets defensive line is better than the opponent's offensive line, I think they have a significantly higher chance of winning. And um, that's why I raised that when you looked at the Ravens game, where it's like, okay, the Ravens do some stuff. We're just talking about the Ravens offense versus the jets defense. Cause it's, it's a different game when you look at the jets offense versus the Ravens defense, but you know, I do like the Jets defensive line matching up against that Ravens offensive line. Schematically, I don't know if I love what the Ravens are going to try to do to this Jets defense, um, especially with all the hate that Lamar's been getting this offseason. He's going to come out of the gates looking to prove a point, looking to prove that he deserves a new contract, whatever. But it, well, maybe he'll already have it by then. But um, but yeah, I don't know. It's just uh, I think the other thing that, that really sticks out to me, and I kind of mentioned him briefly is Quincy Williams. And he is an example. The Jets have had a position and it seems like these positions have gotten fewer and fewer every year under Joe Douglas in 2020. He, it seems like he left pretty much every position open. This is a teardown, whatever rebuilding. And then last year, you know, 
they went into 2021 with a bunch of day three rookies and Bryce Hall at corner. Um, and they, they, you know, they kind of ignored a few positions because the reality is, is when your entire team's a dumpster fire and you have holes at every position on your team, you can't turn it all around in one off season. That's just the reality. So why put yourself deeper into the hole trying to do that when you can just focus on a few positions and make your team better, you know, step by step and not try to, you know, jump ahead. And I think linebacker is an example this year where, you know, whether it's the, the money that they tied up, have already tied up in CJ Mosley, or just the fact that they were trying to address different parts of the, of the field. And when you look at um, San Francisco, it's not like they necessarily addressed a, or, uh, invested a ton into linebacker. I mean, obviously they drafted Fred Warner, but he wasn't a top, a top pick. And then you look at the guys that paired with them. It was just other guys that they had drafted or signed. It wasn't any major investments at that position. So maybe this is just, what the Jets will do at linebacker. But to me, it seems like linebacker is that position this year where they, um, they're they just riding it out with Quincy Williams. I mean, and we'll see. But considering he was a waiver wire addition last year, that would have been surprising if, if you were to tell me that uh, in the middle of the season. But they're kind of treating him like he was a, well, like a, a around three or four rookie who played well, showed some weaknesses, but they're going to try to invest in him. Michael, I I know you're a little lower on Quincy Williams than other people are. What are your thoughts on on him entering year two? I mean, look, he does get a full off season with this team, which I think should be noted because he came in right before the season and he did play well. And, you know, this defense does seem to suit him, but, you know, those highlight plays were mixed in with some, some boneheaded plays all the way through week 18. So how do you feel about him being penciled in as a starter right off the bat? Yeah. I I mean, linebacker and defensive tackle are, um, definitely the two positions they've kind of sacrificed in this whole rebuild. Um, and and well, you definitely they've invested in defensive tackle, but well, I, I mean, just in terms of this off season, uh, in terms of the they, moves that I mean, they, they signed Solomon Thomas, you know, they, uh, they've made some count? moves that counts. They moved JFM back into defensive tackle. That counts. They have Quinn Williams. I mean, they didn't get a run stuff, right? Is what you're saying, I guess. He's definitely a player. Um, so he's got that going for him, but I mean, in in terms of, uh, there are many other positions that they emphasize above those two. I guess we can say that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, you can't fix everything in one off season. So I think it, if you're going to pick two positions to kind of overlook, I guess those are, those are probably two of the better ones to pick because, you know, when you start ranking them, you know, everything offensively is quarterback supporting so that's very important so pretty much every often every offensive position they uh they address offensive line running back receiver tight end that's great you know support zach wilson then defensively they kind of looked at the premium position or the positions that are considered premium first uh and foremost cornerback edge rusher those are the two they focused on and then safety which was uh probably a bigger weakness than defensive tackle and linebacker entering the offseason so um, so, so I get it. Like you can't fix everything. If you're going to pick a couple to, you know, sort of overlook or maybe punt to next off season, uh, those are two positions that make sense, but they are both, you know, pretty big question marks. They're going to have to deal with this season. We talked about defensive tackle and then linebacker. Uh, it's not, it, they're, they're, they're hoping on a lot of development. That's what they're banking on. And Quincy Williams last year had some great flashes. There are definitely plays he made that are top tier linebacker plays just uh, when he does time something correctly and take a good angle, he can lay some huge hits and he can get there very quickly. He's obviously got great speed and athleticism and it makes him a good fit in this defense, brings some coverage ability that Mosley might not have at this stage of his career. Um, And some of the younger linebackers might be a little bit too early to provide, but at the same time, there definitely were a lot of, you know, poor gap filling uh, plays from him throughout the year, misread screens, missed tackles. He did make a lot of mistakes. And in, in a lot of the games where the jets had their most defensive issues or most ugly defensive performances, he played a pretty big role in a lot of those. So uh, it's, it's definitely interesting to see that uh, the votes of confidence that they've given him, how confident they seem in him to not really upgrade linebacker to pencil him in, as the starter, at least so far, um, it's good to see the sign of confidence. And Olberg and Sala are accomplished linebacker coaches. They've coached up a lot of star linebackers throughout their career. So uh, it seems like they know how this position works. So if 
they're confident in him, then I think it's uh, something that you can believe in. But uh, but we'll see because this is the fourth year of his career, I believe he's going into, and he's already you know let go by his initial team despite being a fairly high draft pick. All so right, well, that that's Urban Meyer. That's you can't hold that against him. That's true. Urban Meyer but, and, a, and a scheme change. So that's true. But um, yeah, but still. So so we'll see what happens. But uh, there there is some potential. Yeah, I think the thing that just jumps out to me about this is just when you look at the whole picture about how they want to play with the defensive line, you put a lot of pressure on your linebackers to be able right. to read those gaps and to, or to be able to make those decisions quickly and di- di- be able to diagnose uh, when something is a screen or a draw or a misdirection or just trying to take advantage of the type of defense that they're playing uh, in the trenches. So, yeah, you're putting a lot of faith into Quincy Williams. I think C.J. Mosley was a lot better than people are giving him credit for last year. Uh, Obviously, like, look, he had some misplays or whatever. But overall, I think C.J. played well, considering this is not a defense that was necessarily designed for him, um, considering he was a 3-4 inside linebacker, more of a thumper type. And now he's in this 4-3 spaced out defense where everybody's – it's this attack style. And and I think C.J.'s – Ability to be able to read those gaps and diagnose plays quickly pay dividends. I think without CJ Mosley, this defense somehow would have been way worse. <laughs> um, so he's another guy where it's like, oh God, if he goes down, it's like outside of him, the linebackers that the Jets have, like you kind of mentioned briefly, is that there are a lot of a lot of young guys and a lot of guys who are converted safeties or those smaller will linebackers pass coverage. And I get the vision for what the jets are trying to do. Like at least the jets have a vision that I do understand. It's like, okay, they want to have an all out attack front and then they want fast heat seeking missiles at linebacker who are just able to clean up whatever the defensive line can't get. And they just want to be fast. I mean, they, that all gas, no break. They clearly followed through on that. Um, But outside of CJ Mosley, they don't really have a, a Sam linebacker or more of a run stopper, a thumper, which is fine. I mean, like draw Davis, I guess he was a bit of a hybrid, but like he looked awful last year. So it's like, okay, I guess the, the faster guys, the more athletic guys, uh, the pass coverage guys are going to shine in this defense, but man, you're putting a lot of pressure on the linebackers um, with the type of defense that you're trying to play. And it's like, God help us if CJ Mosley goes down and if Quincy Williams doesn't take a leap. Um, because they could get shredded uh, in that portion of the field. I, right. I, and, I, this and, is... and to your point of like, you know, all those guys being converted safeties and stuff, it does kind of match up with the defensive tackle and sort of the stubbornness there where it's like, you know, again, we have another position where I, I get what the identity is and that that's awesome. It, it really is because the Jets have not had an identity offensively or defensively for a long time. So it's great. But again, a linebacker, you know, Quincy Williams, Jamie and Sherwood, Hampson, Nazaldeen, and now you throw Marcel Harris in there. All these guys are smaller linebackers, great athletes, which is awesome, but you got to at least have, you know, some yeah. extra meat in there, you know, someone who could back up Mosley. Um, it, it just seems like they're kind of over committing to the identity a little bit and kind of, um, kind of overlooking the need for, you know, we, we do kind of need the other end of the spectrum too, just to rotate in there, you know, for certain situations. It's like they have Mosley, they have Quinn and Williams at their respective positions, and then everyone else is in the same boat. So it, they, it just kind of wish there was a little bit more balance with the skill sets on the depth chart. I mean, look at look at what we just did here. We opened up the podcast talking about overreactions, and then we took one quote from Jeff Wolbrick and we spent 30, <laughs> 30 minutes, 30 it's minutes dissecting. Into well, this. okay, but the point, I mean, look, every podcast can't be a love fest. Every, we are very <laughs> optimistic. Uh, I think it's important to talk about this type of stuff. I'll, I'll say this. So there's one more thing we want to talk about before we get out of here, but I'll say this. Um, what in your eyes, what is a good, what is it? What does a realistic good Jets defense look like next year? What, like in your, how do you see this defense playing out? Let's say they, they do kind of perform in the, in what we see with Jeff Ulbrich and Robert Sala. I mean, like, where do you see this defense ranking? I mean, what does this look like? Is this a high turnover, high sack, but also maybe a high yardage defense. I mean, like just how do you kind of see this defense in their vision? Cause there are very clear holes, but they also have a clear identity that will come with their own strengths. Right. And again, it's, this is June. I mean, a lot will happen. They might add some guys, some guys might go out for the whole season. Well, they might be a dominant from week one and we know nothing. That's fine. And we're just raising some, some concerns because it's June and we have nothing else to talk about, but um, 
we've been a little negative the last 20 minutes. This was out of character for this podcast. So let's be positive. What does a good Jets defense look like in, in 2022? Well, I, I think sort of like you said, I think they're going to be banking on that, um, trying to get value out of those big plays, you know, holding up in the red zone and creating turnovers. I think that's where the value is going to come in. I think they're going to give up a lot of yards. They're going to struggle against the run. Uh, it's it's just kind of hard to see them not struggling against the run. Yeah, but you could still be a good defense in spite of that. If because you can, football is a weird game where you could you know get beat up all day, but if you can make the big plays in the big spots, you can make up for it. Right. Um. So I think that they're gonna hope to create a lot of pressure and then capitalize on that pressure with some of the guys they've added in the secondary. Um. And you know aim to win through a lot of sacks, a lot of turnovers and good red zone defense. So um, I think they're going to be a bottom 10 run defense in pretty much every metric, but I do this think this is your positive do... outlook. Listen, I'm, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Keep I, going. You're being, you're, I no, you're, keep being going. Fair. you're being fair, but um, at the same time, I think, uh, well, this isn't my positive outlook then, I guess, I guess this is. No, that's I honestly, I'm, I'm more, I'd rather hear this, I guess, but um. But yeah, I just, I just I, didn't want you to say that they're going to be the worst defense in the league again. So. Right. I'm, I'm not I'm not going to say that. So bottom 10 run defense. But I do think they have top 10 sack potential. I think they're going to end up in that realm. And then the big X factor, I think, for me is can they get the turnovers? I, I think the pressure is going to be there for sure. But, you know, can they get those turnovers? Last year was a huge issue. Only seven picks last year which was the second fewest in the league, and that's not going to get it done. But now you add Sauce Gardner, you add DJ Reed, who who isn't actually a big turnover guy, but should have more chances in this defense. Um, you add Jordan Whitehead. So I think they're going to have a lot of opportunities to get those interceptions. So um, I think they're going to be top 10 in sacks. And can the, I think they're going to be middle of the pack in interceptions. And then hopefully they can get a uh, pretty good – totals in terms of fumbles uh, thanks to the the pressure on the quarterback. And then I think they're going to be good in the red zone. Um, maybe like inside the 10 or like, like inside the five, they might struggle a little bit with goal line runs, but um, I think in the rest of the red zone, you know, but from 20 to 10, like, I don't think they're going to give up a ton of, I think it's going to be hard to score fades on the jets. Like when it gets really condensed, I think their pass defense is going to be really good. So I think the red zone defense will be strong. And third down defense, I think they will be good at, at that as well. Because, you know, you think about third down when the Jets can just throw out, you know, Carl Lawson, Jermaine Johnson, JFM, Quinn Williams, yeah. and just go after teams. That's when they're going to be dangerous. So I think they're going to give up a lot of rushing yards. They're going to give up some long drives. But I do think they're going to get the big plays to make up for it and hopefully be uh, about an average defense overall. Yeah, I think that's that's a good way to look at it. Um, I think it's a, it's a realistic way to look at it. And look, in today's NFL, bunch of high flying offenses, a lot of points are going to be scored. I mean, if you're going to go anywhere, you need to have a good offense. And I actually like how this Jets offense is built. I actually have less questions about the Jets offense than I do the defense. Obviously, a lot of it comes down to Zach Wilson's uh, Zach Wilson, um, but I still feel like the offense is is built in a position where it's like, all right, well, if if the offense is bad a lot of the blame can go to Zach Wilson and not really how it's built because I feel like they've done a good job. I mean, like, look, there's some tiny nitpicky things, really only a center maybe, or offensive tackle if Becton can't stay healthy or whatever. But outside of that, it's like, can't really compl- complain about the tight end group at all. Really good receiver room. Maybe you can upgrade from Corey Davis next year. Uh, if he disappoints, I think you have one of the better running back rooms and Brees Hall hasn't even played it down, but I'm already confident in, in, in him being at least a, a good NFL player, if not a great NFL player. Um, so a lot of it just comes down to Zach Wilson. Uh, and and then I think we saw a lot of the creativity from Michael Floor, so I don't have the same concerns about him that I might as, as Jeff Ulbrich. So it's an offensive it's an offensive league. If the Jets have a, a good offense, I don't think this is going to be a bad team. I think this offense is going to carry them. But then when you look at the defense, like you said, it is smart to just – build a defense on the big plays. And like I've said, they're built to win on third down. Obviously they're going to play a lot of zone, but they're built to win in man coverage and they do a lot of man on third down. I think that is a misconception and solid note of that this week. It's like they do play more man than they're giving credit for. Um, They're built to get turnovers and sacks and and create a lot of pressure. That run defense though, it's going to come down to Quinn Williams, CJ Mosley and Jordan Whitehead. Those three guys are going to have to hold up um, on first down for this Jets defense to to have a chance. And, And honestly, I think CJ Mosley is, is 
out of the three of them, it's hard. I mean, maybe Quinn is the most important, but I was going to say CJ is a huge piece for this defense because I think he is the glue that ties this defense together. Because if he goes out, I don't know what your line. I mean, who comes in? I mean, Sherwood or Marcel Harris or Hamza. Right. I mean, like next to Quincy Williams, who's already, I mean, like obviously has the fun plays, but CJ is the glue of this defense. And if he stays healthy, if he plays all 17 games, I don't think, uh, I don't think this defense is worse than it is la- than it was last year. I think this defense is going to take some, some substantial improvements, but if CJ goes down, then that opens up the defense to some holes, I guess. But, um, but yeah, overall, I mean, look, we've been very positive, but I think there are some concerns with this defense. And, and like I said, you'll learn a lot week one. I mean, that is a great test for them. And, and it'll be hard to avoid the every, we do it every year after week one. And because that's all we have to, to look at. And we make our entire judgments for the rest of the year, which in some years it's been right, uh, I guess, but you know, even if the Jets get blown out week one, it's not necessarily indicative of how they'll perform over the next 16 games. But Michael, we did not do a, a podcast reaction to the schedule. Um, that's already been, you know, beaten to death. Um, but there are some things about the schedule maybe we, we do want to talk about before we get out of here. I'll just start with Baltimore, and I guess we have the next few months to talk about it. But we've been talking about the run defense. I mean, how do you feel the Jets defense schematically matches up against a team like the Ravens, who are so unique? But, I mean, can you name how – many, how many Ravens receivers can you name without looking it up? All right, I'll take an honest shot at it right now. Cats here. Um, Rashad Bateman. Yep. It's the only one I can name, I think. I, I have another one, I think, if he's still a receiver. Um, that might be all I have. Is Miles Boykin on the Ravens? Is that I one? I think he is. Um, I was going to say Devin Duvernay. Let me see if – yeah, he's still a receiver. Okay, okay, there you go. Devin Duvernay. But it's not a team that's built around its receivers, which is, which is interesting. Go. That's the point. <laughs> which is interesting. They have good tight ends. I mean, obviously, Mark Andrews is a threat. I mean, he's essentially going to be their receiver number one. And, and look, I like Bateman a lot coming out. So maybe he's a guy that really – part of maybe part of the reason they trade Hollywood Brown is they have a lot of faith in Bateman. And if Bateman's good, then who really cares? But, um, but right now, yeah, it's not a team that's built around the receivers. Um, they have some offensive linemen, but it's not like they have a dominant offensive lineman or offensive line, but this team is built to, to run the football. I mean, this team is built a very specific and unique way. How do you think that type of offense that they run, which is almost a college offense at times, I mean, not saying that they don't, you know, do pro style offense and that Lamar can't throw. Obviously I think Lamar is, is a better thrower than giving credit for, for the national media. I think he's a very good quarterback. It's a shame that they're not giving him more help outside. Um, but how do you feel like that style of, of offense kind of, uh, goes up against this type of defense that the Jets are playing, which is all attack, all speed, all gas, no break, and not really reading gaps. It, it's not a good matchup, I think, to yeah. be honest. <laughs> I, I think this is, like you said, this is a great test because I think this is the number one run game that's probably best built to exploit this kind of this kind of defense. And we saw the Jets struggle against these kind of teams last year, like when they played New England. Um, but this is the, you know, the pinnacle of that kind of offense, like gap runs, pulling guards, fullback. Um, it's a power running team and it's a, a tough matchup against, you know, the Jets can maybe do better against zone running teams that are, you know, just getting off the ball. Everyone's going horizontally. So if one guy just, you know, makes a good play, beats his, his blocker off the ball, he can shoot into the backfield, hit the running back right away. And he could, you know, blow up some plays that way. But against a gap running team, that's a little more patient at setting up its blocks and is, you know, sort of anticipating what the defensive line is going to do and particularly aiming at certain holes uh, and trying, you know, they'll run traps and stuff like that, you know, knowing that your defensive line is going to come up the field, punish that guy for doing it and run straight at that spot. Uh, it's, it's designed to stop this sort of defense. So um, this is – their chance to show like sort of the philosophy I was just talking about. I think they're going to, they're going to get run on pretty badly, but they can make up for that. If they lock down the receivers and give up nothing through the air, if they can get to Jackson a few times and create some turnovers, force them into mistakes. So this is, you said it, this is the perfect test to start the season for this defense because it's a run game that's built to stop, uh, built to exploit this defense, but it's also a passing game that uh that they can exploit with their secondary and their pass rush so um we're gonna see how well they can handle their greatest weakness that run defense especially against a a power running team 
But we're also going to see, can this secondary and this pass rush make up for that against a passing game that might not be as strong as that run game? Yeah, and I think the, the only thing that gives me hope in this matchup is that I, I am confident in the Jets' defensive line against this offensive line. Now, when you get to schematics, like you're saying, I mean, this offense is kind of built to take advantage of those over-aggressive defenses, and Lamar makes plays happen out of, you know, he makes something out of nothing quite often. But, yeah, I mean, I, I like, you know, Morgan Moses is a starter for them. I like the matchup of, of Jermaine Johnson. I guess he's a rookie, but it's like you can move Carl Lawson over there. I, I like Carl Lawson going up against Morgan Moses at times. I like Quinn and Williams and JFM going up against that interior. Yeah, they got Linderbaum, but, you know, we'll see. Linderbaum is is – is good, but again, he's a rookie and he's undersized. I mean, let's, he's a little different than the, what the Ravens have run in years past in terms of what they've asked from their centers. They run that man gap power scheme and Tyler Linderbaum is more of a, a zone center. So maybe they're changing some things up, but um, it'll be a very interesting matchup. I, I don't feel great about it. I, I mean, I'm still excited. You and I are going to the game. I think it's going to be a great crowd. Uh, I think, I do think the jets have a chance. I, I mean, I think there are worse teams that could have played here, you know, like, Obviously, the Bills would be a tougher team, but this is among the toughest teams that they could face. But it's also a team that I do see a path to victory. And that path is, like you said, on third down. It's like this Jets defensive line smothering Lamar Jackson in that pocket and and they're these Jets corners dominating these Ravens receivers. When you go to the offensive side of the ball, I don't necessarily think this is uh, going to be Zach Wilson's uh, breakout day. I, I, I think his, his, his second year might get off to a colder start. But if he can just have the type of games that he was having – down the stretch, which maybe weren't statistically dominant, but he was taking care of the football and he was managing the games, you know, especially like the type of game he got saw against the bucks, which statistically, if you look at it, wasn't like a dominant performance, but you and I both know that that was as easily his best game of the year. Um, and he was against a similar type of defense. We'll see how much the, the, the Ravens have changed their defensive philosophies. They got a new defensive coordinator. Um, but this is again, another three, four man defense, great secondary. They're going to throw those exotic blitzes, those zero blitzes. And then those, fake blitzes where everybody drops back. And so it's going to be on Zach Wilson uh, from week one. Um, but I think the difference for them offensively is they're going to have to run the football. I mean, they're really going to have to punish this front seven. Uh, and then Zach Wilson's going to have to do what he get, did uh, week 17 against the Bucks, which is those, those progressions, especially over the middle, finding those holes. Um, the thing that does make me feel a little bit better about this matchup, and look, the Ravens arguably have the best secondary in the league, is I do feel like the Jets finally do have guys who can beat man coverage especially Garrett Wilson, obviously Elijah Moore, uh, but bringing in Uzama, bringing in Conklin, obviously at the running back position, when the Ravens do man up and run those man blitzes, like you saw, I think the best example I've ever seen of this was the seeing ghost game in 2019 Ravens and Patriots run a similar type of defense, but you saw, I mean, just looked like Sam Darnold couldn't do anything. And granted he had times where guys are open and whatever, but I mean, the offensive line was getting dominated and the receivers couldn't get open and he was getting sacked and hit within two seconds. It'll be a lot different. Uh, the offensive line is a lot better, and I think they have finally playmakers who can make plays in man coverage, which is really what it's going to come down to in this game. So we have months and months to, to analyze this game. It's a tough test week one. I think, uh, you know, you don't want to go out here and predict a, a win, but um, I think they have they have a chance. But, you know, it, it's, it's a tough it's a tough one. I think overall the, the first half of that schedule is exceedingly tough. You and I had a bit of a disagreement the day the schedule came out. Uh, we – we were going to do a podcast and I got sick, then you got sick and whatever. But um, you were, you were saying that you didn't really think that the schedule was that important, that the order of the, the games were that important. And maybe, I don't know if your argument has changed at all. This was a few weeks ago. Uh, maybe explain your point or if it's changed your, your updated view on this, because I do, I did at the time have quite a few counter arguments to, to the point you're making, but it seems like for the, you know, a few years in a row now, the Jets have been getting screwed, um, you know, the beginning weeks of their schedule. Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess it was just interesting to where we already knew who they'd be playing and where for a few months, but then the schedule comes out. It's like, oh, look at this tough schedule the Jets have, as if we didn't know who they were playing already. But, I mean, it they definitely did kind of get a little bit of the short end of the stick in terms of the difficulty leaning towards the first half. But, I mean, it's it's just so hard to project how tough a schedule actually is. I mean, there are there are so many NFL teams right now that we're looking at. I feel like more than ever the league right now, you look at all these teams, there are more teams than ever that you look at and, and sort of think that's a really good team. But at the end of the day, the season's going to play out and the same amount of games are going to be won as every single season. 
So basically there are going to be teams that aren't as good as you think they are. And the other part of it is going to be true as well. There are going to be teams that are better than you think they're going to be. So we really just don't know because there's so much change every year. But I mean, some things you do know, like playing Aaron Rodgers on the road is hard. Playing Russell Wilson on the road is hard. Um, but that's provided those guys are healthy and they play those games, which isn't a guarantee. Um, so, so, well, I don't know. I, we just kind of already knew who the teams would be. So it's, it's not the perfect schedule I would have made, but um, it, we also aren't completely sure if all these games are going to be as hard as you think they're going to be. That's fair. And look, they do get a few breaks where it's like, all right, looks like Deshaun Watson could be suspended week two. You mentioned that Packers game, Lambo will definitely be tough, but they're coming off of a, a game in London with no buy in, in between. Um, so th- th- there are a few moments like that. And like you said, every year there are teams that are hyped up that will disappoint. Uh, I think the Broncos have a chance to be a Super Bowl contender and also have a chance to not make the playoffs. It really comes down to which Russell Wilson you're getting and, and how the rest of that team performs. But um yeah, I think uh, – I mean, I, I disagree with kind of how you were minimizing minimizing it at the time. You're like, well, they're going to play all these games anyways. If, if they're going to make the jump, they'll have made the jump. And I, th- I agree with that to, an, to a certain extent. But at the same time, this is a young team, year two. It's a team that's going to get better as, this, as the year goes on. And you were kind of hoping that they could get a few games early on to build their confidence, to build Zach Wilson's confidence. Because if you don't think that confidence matters, it really does, especially for a young quarterback. I mean, he's human. Um, and the more confident he gets, uh, the better he's going to play. You saw in the Titans game, he made a few plays, and all of a sudden the offense started to open up because he wasn't as – didn't seem like he was panicking as much, trying to force something to happen. And when you have a bad game and then you have to go and play the Browns and Miles Garrett eats your offense up, and then you you know then you got to go play the, the Bengals who were just in the Super Bowl. Like all of a sudden you start to have bad game after bad game after bad game, and then you're in New York and – you know, the media has put all this pressure on you. I mean, hell, he had four bad passes in an OTA practice in June and he was all over Twitter. So it's like, you know, that stuff does matter. And so it's like when you play all these hard teams, the narrative of your season is going to be written in those first few games. And, you know, if they don't come out of the gate swinging, if they don't come out overachieving, yeah, it's going to be largely negative. And that Zach Wilson's a bust. And then that will translate to the field, no matter how much he tries to avoid it. Those boo birds will come out those questions at press conferences will come out and that does matter. And so that's kind of what I was saying. And just ignoring Zach Wilson, just as a team, you kind of want to start to build the confidence and just prove that these, this young team that's, that's trying to gel that has so many new pieces can do it. So that's kind of what I was kind of disappointed to see the type of start that they're going to have. However, I will say this, I don't think the AFC North is as bad as maybe we think it is. Obviously the Ravens are, I think out of the, all of the teams, the toughest matchup, but again, we, we have outlined that there are some ways to beat them, you know, specifically this Jets defensive line versus their offensive line. You go week two, if Deshaun Watson doesn't play, who knows? I mean, it's probably Jacoby Brissett. Uh, it's unlikely Baker Mayfield's still there. Um, you know, maybe the Jets squeak one out there. Week three, the Jets beat the Bengals last year. Um, and statistically, the team that loses the Super Bowl is not as good uh, the following year. And then you go, you know, playing in Pittsburgh is never easy, but rookie quarterback at Kenny Pickett and a team besides that, that like, look, has some pieces definitely on defense, but I don't think as a playoff team. So it's like, if the Jets can come out of those first four games with, you know, at least one win, but you know, how two and two, like if they can beat a Deshaun Watson list Browns team and the Steelers two and two, I, I like how the Jets are looking. And then, you know, you know, the, the consequence of having all these horrible games to start the season is that the back half of that schedule is light. And it's like, if they can get to the bye week, and I feel like we say this every every year, but if they can just get to the bye week just around 500, even if they're a game or two below 500, they have a lot of winnable games down the stretch, and they can really pick up steam. And, and look, for me, playoffs is not the I – think, I think the Jets can compete for playoffs. I think there's a scenario where the Jets can not compete for a playoff spot, and, you know, obviously going to be cheering for that, but – that won't be the the benchmark for success for me. If the Jets hit seven, eight wins and Zach Wilson looks good, but they lose a you know a few games because they can't stop the run and whatever, they have a few bad games, some guys get injured, whatever. But they win seven, eight games and Zach Wilson progresses and you know some of these other guys look good and the rookies look whatever. Like I, I'm happy, you know. And then and then you go into that next offseason like all right, this is the offseason. They have to put the pieces together to make the big jump. Um, and I'd be happy about that. So I don't know. Those are kind of my thoughts about reading the schedule is just like, all right, I wish it was a little easier at the start, but you know, end of the day, um, there are, there are chances for them to win early on. Right. Uh, and like you said, guys yeah. get injured. You never know. Yeah. 
All right. Well, Michael, I guess I guess that'll wrap it up for us. Um, like I said, we do have a few things planned uh, on the podcast and on YouTube um, that we'll be working on over the next few weeks. So we're excited about that. They have their final voluntary OTA practices this week. I think one of them's open to the media. So I'm sure we'll get some more uh, some more storylines and quotes. Uh, and then we have the mandatory practices the next week. And that'll be, I think the real big storyline there will be the offensive tackles because both George Fant and Makai Becton aren't there. Uh, this will be the first time you could see Makai Becton in person on the field. We'll see how he looks. We'll see who, who lines up at left tackle, who lines up at right tackle. Um, that'll be the main thing I think you can take away from those practices. And then, yeah, it's six weeks and of nothing of us trying to, to make content. And then it's training camp. And that I love training camp. I mean, it's tough because inevitably they're not going to There are some injuries that always seem to, to ruin it, but I think training camp is just such a fun time of the year, especially when you get to those preseason games. So, you know, it's June and then, you know, soon enough, it'll, it'll be a, a week one and we'll be dissecting that, uh, <laughs> the loss of the Baltimore Ravens week one. Yeah. Way, way to end this with some optimism. I've, I was really <laughs> optimistic in this podcast. That, that's all I talked about. It's a change of pace for us. I think this entire off season, we've been talking about how awesome and amazing Joe Douglas and Robert Sala is. So we have to, we have to shit on somebody and sorry, Jeff Ulbrich. He was the, the target, I, but look, I still see it. Well, we've already laid it. I still see a scenario where this Jets defense is good. I just think there's, there's some red flags you can raise. Yeah, This is the 32nd ranked there. defense in the league. It's a 32nd yeah. ranked defense of the league. It's fair most to be point, like, also right, most not... points allowed in team history. So yeah, it's like, it's, fair it's okay to, to not be all stuff. sunshine and roses about this defense. I'm optimistic, but let's, you know, there are questions. All right. You can follow us at CYJ pod on Twitter, myself at uh, Ben W. Blessington, Michael, Michael underscore Nanny. Go to jetsxfactor.com for the best place to go for Jets content. Uh, like, rate, review on iTunes, subscribe on YouTube. Anything that, else, that was really, uh, really positive the way you said that. It sounds like you really want well, them to do it. <laughs> been a few weeks a little rusty <laughs> we'll get back uh you know i missed a few practice i missed a few throws in otas i'm gonna get criticized in the comments a little yes. rusty but we're working back um yeah any last words though any legitimate last words any last thoughts before we uh before we wrap this up you know i'm gonna talk about uniforms no. whenever you say that it's gotta go into uniforms or we talk about, about the, the ob1 show okay no please god no um <laughs> Yeah, what are you going to mention though? The Falcons alternate red helmet. Maybe the Jets give us a throwback. Oh, I, this I week? didn't see that. I got to look that up right now. You didn't see the yeah the Falcons uh, bringing back that alternate red. So I think they're the first team to officially have a a second helmet. Oh, nice! Um, that could look pretty, that's pretty good. I know. I wish they I wish they paired it with the red jerseys, but they're, they're just going with the. I think they're going with the gradient jerseys. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, there's still time. I think the Jets, if they were smart, they would just give us the 80s logo. But we'll I see. don't know. I'm, I'm not the hugest 80s logo fan. Oh, God, not this again. All right, I'm going to wrap this up before I hear this dumb argument. It's not a dumb argument. It's just, I don't know. It doesn't, I don't think it complements this uniform that well. How not? The shoulder stripes are pretty much a direct, I mean, they look not identical, but. It's just it looks not like a the great contract. logo. It's classic. It's just not a great logo. Yeah, it is. Come on. What are you talking about? How many good jet airplane logos have you seen? It, it is kind of hard to have a good logo with a jet in it. Right. Stylistically. And I don't mean to say anything. I see a lot of people who aren't Jets fans just wearing, you know, models and a- other athletes wearing that sweatshirts with that on. And the, you don't see them wearing the giant I, I was describing bean. this to you, but I think – like the wing has to be moved over a little bit because there's kind of a long yeah. segment there where it's just a it's just a straight line and then the wing starts at the end. Um, next next practice we send you next practice next practice you go to th- that should be your question to Robert Sala. What are your thoughts on the forms. '80s logo? <laughs> Do you think they should extend the wing section of the '80s logo oh, God, a Jesus little bit Christ. towards the left oh, Jesus. and be like, yeah, okay. um, I-, I agree with you, Michael. Okay, I regret asking. All right, thank you for listening, everybody. Uh, we should be back to our regularly scheduled programming uh, next Monday. We'll have a podcast. Thanks for listening. Go Jets.